Hello comic book junkies, it's the Frog Queen here, and I just got back from the Toronto Comics Arts Festival, and do I have some footage and interviews for you. I'm going to start this series of videos off with a video interview with GMB Kamichik. He is a graphic novel artist and writer from Winnipeg. He is most well known for his titles Infintium, Midnight City, Will I See, Rust and Water, and Medicine. We are going to be speaking a little about each of these titles, as well as Komachuk's very unique artist process. So without further delay from me, here's GMB Komachuk. So, I want to first ask you um, about what was your, what's your most recent uh, book? Ooh, my most recent book, normally you would say whatever came out this month, but this month I had uh, two different books come out. One is Midnight City which is Pulp Era and Golden Age characters versus H.P. Lovecraft and H.G. Wells monsters. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, and the other one is called Medicine, mm -hmm. which is um, a truth-telling story that essentially outlines the real emotional cost of a life in medicine. Yeah. So the monsters in this one are made up and the monsters in this one are real. Wow. Um, and this one, I think we were just uh, discussing um, is actually co-written by a doctor. Yeah, Dr. Jillian Horton and I collaborated on this and then uh, I did art chores on it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, she had a fun process though where I would send my pages and she would cut them up and then rearrange them the way that she saw it fit better uh, the beats of the narrative and then I would take those, scan them and then rearrange my pages and then so we had a really fun collaborative project working on that. That's awesome. Do you find that um, you, know, you both Collaborate with people, but also um, create your books completely by yourself. Yeah, I write for some illustrators, I illustrate for some writers, and I write and illustrate my own work as well. That's insane. How do you keep everything separated? Um, you mean mentally or like physically? Mentally. Hmm. Um, <laughs> I think that's the challenge. That's right? the challenge? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe not. <laughs> it was harder to do at first. Now I've done enough books that I... Um, separate my week. I have a, a pretty strict writing schedule and I have a pretty strict way of uh, dividing my day when I'm not traveling and um, I used to wait for the muse to show up and now I just keep it chained in a box and when I need it I open the box and take what I need. Okay. Um, what is your process? Like because when I'm flipping through your books, let me just maybe I'll just show my audience so they can see. There's so much different stuff going on. Um, I'm astounded. I saw you drawing, but I'm still like, these kind of look like photographs. It kind of looks like collage sometimes, but then it doesn't. And I, I can't figure out the process for this. So I'm a big Max Ernst fan, and uh, he was a surrealist artist that would take, um, you know, woodcut illustrations and recontextualize them and then release them as his own books and stories. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that doesn't really work in the comics medium, but what I do like doing is I do pen and ink illustration, and then I'll often um, take scans of that, print them, and then collage them into different arrangements, and then take a scan of that, um, take some photo reference that I've shot myself, or that I work sometimes with a uh, photographer, Michael Sanders, so he and I will go out shoot reference, um, either models or places together. I sort of art direct it, um, and then use that photography as layers within the work. Okay, wow, that is like the most different process I think I've ever heard. For comics. Well, I'm it's glad that you art. called it process and not like <laughs> madness, which is what some <laughs> other people... When I first started in comics, I had a lot of people say to me like, Hey man, this isn't comics. This doesn't count. This what? isn't... Re oh yeah. The purists, the traditionalists, you know, you have to... You know, it should be pencils, it should be inks, it should be digital colors, it should be, you know... Um, I don't really agree with that. No. Stories are stories. And mm -hmm. Pictures and words together are comics. Um, art is art. I don't know how anyone can put art in a box. That's just so bizarre to me. Why would you do that? Yeah, That's boxes like, are for muses, don't you know? Yeah. <laughs> just take my person and stick them in this box and yeah. pull them out when I need them. Yeah. Um, no, that's so that's so great, but it, it does kind of sound like madness when you describe it as all those different things that you're bringing from all these different places and then trying to put them into one page. Part of it is pragmatism, a little bit. Um, I have a lot of stories I want to tell and, a lot, and only so many hours in the day. Mm -hmm. And so when I first started, the idea that um, I could take some shortcuts 
uh, visually. It actually turned out to be long cuts. You know, every shortcut makes a long delay, as they say. And so, and so I was like, oh, maybe I'll cut this photo up and use it in the background so I don't have to draw the background. And then it led me down this entire um, system of drawing backgrounds and then photographing backgrounds that I had drawn and then collaging those photos. In, and it was just like this, you know, um, exploratory, creative fervor that went on for a while. And then at the end, there was sort of this mess that was comics. And uh, there's not too many other ways to describe it, I guess. Um, so different projects, I take a very different, like the, um, the work I did for Midnight City is very, um, I've ex described it before as sort of 40s propaganda overlaid with 30s pulp sensibilities where 60s style guides overlap with that. And that's what this book, that was sort of my, um, the creative limitations that I put on myself to make this book. Mm -hmm. Whereas with medicine, we were not trying to tell a, a comics story, um, but it was a comic narrative. Okay. And so um, one of the things that I did for the art was to take, you know, it's a four color process more or less. Um, but I used institutional colors, so I went around to different hospitals and, you know, dentistry academies and things and took color samples of the paint and I used those as the right. color. I love that you color. have the green in there because that's the most, like, pervasive one in the hospitals in Nova Scotia that I see this green. And it, it's always, I know why those colors are chosen for hospitals, but for me, it always felt very unnerving, and I felt like it was a sick color, and I always associated it with sickness. Yeah, do you think if we would like, if that paint became popular and people started doing their living rooms, they'd like hospitals more? <laughs> no, I think they'd just start hating their living no, room if they so? had to go to the hospital. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we associate, what's interesting is that the, it, you know, um, in Midnight City, when I wanted to sort of put someone on edge, I put some tentacles and some mood lighting and some horrible teeth, and everyone is like, oh, that's scary. But in medicine, I just had to put that green color behind a woman standing still, and people would go like, "Oh, I don't." I don't like feel this. so great. Yeah. yeah, that's so interesting, though. Like how like um, a color can set the tone, you know? And I mean, I mean, there's psychology behind it, like massive amounts of it. But uh, I yeah. think that's the best part about art, you know? Well, color is uh, color played a big role in the last the book I did just before those other two, which was Will I See, which I did uh, in collaboration with David Alexander Robertson, uh, singer songwriter Isque, and uh, her uh, collaborator Aaron Leslie, and it's a book about you know missing and murdered Indigenous women and children. But we only used one color. There's a spot color in here, uh, and the red shows up to create mood. And for a long time, I wasn't sure if it was the right choice. And then when we finally saw the book actually printed and saw people respond to that. Um, even I was a little bit shocked that it didn't work. Mm. Um, that's uh, kind of a very Frank Miller-esque, I guess, I always still think of Frank Miller when he does that yeah. spot color. Like that um, yellow bastard. Yes, exactly, right. But it, it does, it, it drives the point home, right? And it's always going to uh, attract your attention and make you make you think of it more when it's that pop, you know? Well, and there's this weird commercial thing that goes on when you talk to book publishers, um, you know, everyone will give you a different stat, but it's roughly, they'll say you'll get 30% more sales if your book is in color than if it's in black and white. Um, and yet we did Infinitum completely black and white, and because it's a noir book, that hasn't affected that mm. at all. You know, people see it, absence of color as being integral to the story, mm -hmm. so... Yeah, um, no, and I'm, it's such a, I've heard that, that thing about that 30%, 30%, like, let's do it in color. Mm -hmm. The f most, the majority of the books that attract my attention aren't in color, and I always find that kind of interesting. Why do you think that's true? I don't honestly know. Well, I am super goth most of the time, so... <laughs> It's like I, I wear black on the outside because black's how I feel on the inside. Right. I don't know, but um, yeah, honestly, I don't. I don't know why that is. But uh, maybe it's because I appreciate the ink more. Maybe it's because I appreciate line art more. I'm. I'm not 100 percent sure. But. I know that in my own work, if uh, I think there's probably a lot of artists that would agree with this. Maybe not publicly, but mm -hmm. I'll be the one to say it out loud. Um, you can save a book with color. You know, a, a work that you say to yourself, like, oh, it's right. not, it doesn't have the depth, it doesn't have the emotion Something's that I need. Missing. Something's yeah. missing. 
you can use color to immediately create a visceral response this where texture. that's absent in the art. Whereas, you know, we're here at TCAF and there are so many black and white books here. Amazing black and white books. And it's right in the draftsmanship. Like, you know, you flip through a few pages and you just have this emotional response and you realize it's completely the storytelling. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess that's it, right? If you're good, you're good. You don't need some color splash on the page, I guess, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Unless you're making a point. <laughs> but you know what? There's, you know, I'd be the first to admit that there are pages in Midnight City that work, that wouldn't work without the color. You know, like the blue tones here on these pages set the mood uh, that the art can't convey. So that's either a feeling of me as an artist, um, or, you know, I just, you have to pick your battles too, mm -hmm. you know. Um, speaking of picking things and choosing things, how did you choose to publish? Like, what, what was your challenge when you went to be like, I'm going to publish my first book? The path. The path to publishing. Ooh. I always ask people this question. Okay. I think it's because it's always pretty different and interesting, you know. So um, I'd always drawn. I'd always written. Um, I'd written two drafts of different novels, and I was, you know, the the essential advice you get when you're writing novels is, you know, you should write what you know. Mm -hmm. You should write what you see. You should write what you experience. But I wanted to write these weird stories about tentacle beasts and, you know, giant creatures roaming through the city. So I started drawing those things um, and making illustrations and then writing from those illustrations, kind of like embedded journalism. Like, here's a picture or here's the moment that I'm going to write about and I just kind of tried to build a world. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, I had done so many illustrations and I had so many words and I figured, like, oh, well, I guess this is comics. That's interesting. Wow. It just kind of, like... And and yeah, I never, I always put myself as a writer first, that's how I considered it as I sort of started the trajectory, and then uh, art kind of developed along as a way to, I guess, maybe fill in my uh, inadequacies as a writer, it's like, oh, this picture will say it in a, you know, in a thousand words, but in one frame, in a way that I can't get mm -hmm. to in a certain phrase. Hmm, that's really cool. Which book is your first book, actually? I don't know. What's, uh, what's the chronology? Who, uh, well, I don't have all of my work here. I've done, yeah. um, depending on how you count them and what your definition is, I've done between 12 and 16 graphic novels. Um, my very first uh, sort of notable work was a, a book series called The Imagination Manifesto, okay. which was five interconnected stories over three hardcover volumes um, that all shared a central theme what happens when the things we believe in start to come true? So okay. there's a time travel story in there. There was a uh, a cult action adventure a story of two warring clans of alchemists called Magic Words that didn't have any words in it at all, actually. Um, a cowboy story, a ghost story, just all the things that I wanted to experiment with. Um, when, once I told myself I'm going to make comics, but I didn't know what the best way to do. I was going to make comics was. So I tried a bunch of different art styles and a bunch of different story and narrative styles. So some that are very specifically panels and word bubbles and exposition and little boxes and other ones where um, there's like poetry written over the art and other ones that are a merge of those two. And I just tried a lot of things within that volume as a way of saying, you know, what can comics be for me? Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, every project I've done since is kind of an extension of one style in that early collection. Hmm. Okay, that's cool. All right. Uh, well, time travel seems to come up quite a bit in your books then. Yeah, because it's fucking hard. <laughs> Uh, I think every science fiction writer on Earth has probably a time travel story. Yeah. And um, I don't know if mine's the best time travel story. It's certainly not, but it was the hardest thing that I could that I could pick to work on at that time, mm -hmm. um, which I needed at the time that I was working on that book. Um, uh, my mother was quite ill, and so I worked on that as sort of a mental escape from the issues that were going on. So, what was interesting is it started as this, you know, light, high concept, film noir styled uh, time travel murder mystery. And then by the end, by the final draft, it became really a story of my mom and dad and all these sort of little layers that fell into place over the course of working on it that helped distract me from how difficult a time travel murder mystery is to write, but also gave the story more heart than I think it would have had otherwise. Mm, okay. That's interesting. 
Um, so what's next for you? Oof. Lots. Because you've got a lot going on. You've, you're, pro you're promoting a lot right now. You know, that's sort of, that's just part of it, right? You make a book, then you have to show it to people and... and uh, <laughs> get people to read it, Get people attention. to read it, pay attention. <laughs> but to me, it's part of the process. Like, a lot of people, I think, um, they only want to make the books and they hope someone else will take them out. But um, uh, the actual book presentation, going to shows, is sort of my equivalent of the gallery show right like you take it out to the public and you get people's direct reactions and their visceral responses and sometimes they really don't like it at all and sometimes they love it and it's you know it's do you ever have people that like walk by your table and like um they do the double take and they step back and they look and then they kind of like get drawn in and do you ever have the people because uh, i see this all the time and the other people that like say something negative and kind of like scoff and walk off and oh, both. Kinda, like yeah both I, I, both um and you know the truth is that both are perfectly valid. You know, not every book can be for every person. Mm -hmm. um, I do a lot of different types of storytelling, so I try to imagine that I maybe have something for everybody. Um, but it's not always true. And as far as new projects go, I'm uh, uh, co-producing a play right now. Oh, wow. Uh, which is uses a whole bunch of graphic novel elements in it. Um, mm -hmm. We're developing a video game project, um, working on two new kids book projects, and two adult graphic novels. Oh, wow. So. Oh, that's going to keep you busy. It does. <laughs> yeah, it does. But, I mean, it's, um, it's a, a super fun. I don't know any other mm -hmm. way to say it. It's the best job you can have, really. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Um, are you doing any more um, festivals or um, comic-related um, events this year? Uh, yes, many. Can you Probably too many. Let us know. I can, uh, yeah, we'll for sure be doing, um, uh, oof, uh, I'm doing the Night Market in Winnipeg, Fan Quest in Winnipeg, uh, we're doing C4 in Winnipeg, That's, Winnipeg is my home, so we do as many home shows as we can. Okay. Um, I'll also be doing the uh, Toronto, the big Toronto show, which names oh, suddenly escapes me, Toronto Fan Expo. Yeah, Expo, yeah, yeah. We had the Fan Expo, mm -hmm. um, just did Toronto Comic Con. We just did Calgary um, Expo. We'll be doing the Calgary Holiday Show. We'll probably be doing the Toronto Holiday Show too. Should so. definitely um, look at the East Coast. I know we're out in the middle. Oh, we're doing of Vancouver area. too. I'm doing Vancouver. Oh, are you? Yes. Because okay. uh, East Coast now has Halcon for seven years now. Um, so we have a whole comic graphic novel section uh, as well. My uh, collaborator on Cassie and Tonk and Rust and Water, uh, Justin Curry, uh, oh. had some wonderful things to say about Halcon. Yeah. And went, yeah. It's really interesting. It's, it's not like another, other cons, you know. That's what, it's yeah. out in the coast. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Stuart McLean, right? You may not be big, but you're small. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh, and as a result, it's, you're, you can very often in a small city like that, um, become like the big fish in the pond, little pond, you know, pretty easily. So it's kind of a, it's kind of weird that way. But smaller shows are also great because people I find are the pomp and circumstance of like your name tag or your th it, like disappears and people are like, hey, I live here and you're in my city, right? Tell yeah. me about what's going on. And it's oh, yeah. so much more relaxed. I think that's yeah. really great. You can actually have like real conversations, whereas like um, other cons you can't really do that. Yeah. But yeah. Well, and we're all just folks. You know, some people get. This, you know, somehow that you're different because you have a book. All it's just some glue and some paper, uh, and it's not that special. It's words, sure, you're right? But we're not that special, right? We're just people, <laughs> yeah. right? And you can do it too. Everyone can do it. Yeah. Um, so where uh, where can people buy your books? Where can we? Where can they reach you? Where can they find more information on your uh, your work? Uh, you can. Okay, so my name is the hard part. So it's G M B Kamichuk. So it's hard to remember and hard to spell, but I'm easy to find if you look that way. Um, I have a blog there, and I'm on Twitter and Instagram and all those other places, and I try to keep... Um, uh, I'm a, sometimes an oversharer, so sometimes stuff I probably shouldn't, that the publisher doesn't want me to show you, ends up on my Instagram. Uh, <laughs> so you can check that out there. Um, the next, uh, I wish I could tell I have two projects that I'm not allowed to name That's okay. just yet. Um, Happens all the time. But one that I'm working on that I'm very proud of that I can name, which is completely creator owned, is called Drift Hazard. Drift and the, Hazard. And the Hellcats of Venus. 
That sounds like something I would read. It sounds like a pulp novel. It's very, it's, okay, so it has the uh, candy shell of a pulp novel. Okay. Um, and the squishy interior of um, a philosophy book. Oh, okay. So it's sort of a bait and switch. So my hope is that people will see the cover and see the art style and be like, oh, that's like comics like they used to be. Hooray. And then they'll look through it and be like, wait a minute. Right. Okay. thinking here. So that's the hope anyway. Okay. That sounds interesting. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for giving me your time today. Amy, thank you. And uh, hopefully we can, maybe we can catch up again when uh, your next release comes out. Yeah, I'd love and, to. Um, We'll do the Skype thing since we're quite uh, separated by a large body because Canada is so damn wide. But united by technology. Yeah. Way for God. Canada. Yeah, exactly. All right. Thank you so much. Thank and you. I'm going to include all of your information in the description of this video. The description will be below. <laughs> all right. Bye. Thanks for watching, everyone. There will be additional information on Tom Chuck's work, including my personal reviews and thoughts uh, in the future. Also, you can find all creator information in the description of this video. And until next time, remember to read something good.